Unintentional stalling is one of the deadliest mishaps a pilot can commit, causing almost 50% of fatal aviation accidents according to this article from AOPA Air Safety Institute, which analysed crash data from 2000 to 2014. According to AOPA, the overwhelming majority of unintended stalls occur on personal flights in day visual meteorological conditions under light winds. So in other words, there are usually no additional environmental threats or challenges putting the cause of the accident solely on the pilot's ability to recognise the warning signs and initiate the appropriate recovery technique. I've been thinking for quite some time that the way the stalling is taught and tested in the general aviation industry is simply not good enough, and I think the data agrees with my assessment. The majority of these stall accidents occur in a general aviation environment, but we must consider that every pilot has been trained in the GA system and have been subject to the same type of initial training that has not adequately prepared the pilots who exceeded the critical angle of attack and unfortunately didn't live to tell the tale. We have a tendency to learn best what we learn first. This is called the principle of primacy. If we're taught something badly initially, it's difficult to unlearn this and relearn the correct way. In times of stress, like the heat of the moment of an unexpected stall or aircraft upset of some kind, it's quite possible for a pilot to revert back to their initial training covered by their general aviation instructor in light aircraft. Given that the only method for stall recovery is to reduce the angle of attack regardless of the aeroplane being flown, this shouldn't be an issue, unless of course it was taught badly by the initial instructor who himself was taught badly how to teach stalling in the first place. Let's take this Colgan Air stall crash as an example. This is a Bombardier A aircraft which crashed during an approach to runway 23 at Buffalo, New York. As with all air disasters, there are several factors that led to this accident. These include adherence to procedures such as crew resource management and sterile flight deck policies, crew fatigue, crew illness, it appears the first officer had a cold, and what I would like to concentrate on today, crew training and testing, particularly that of the captain. The captain was the pilot flying at the time of this stall. This is a reconstruction using the aircraft's flight data recordings. The aircraft is in a level flight segment, intercepting the localizer for the ILS approach. The thrust levers are very close to flight idle here, flight idle being the minimum setting at this stage. The speed of the aircraft is fairly stable at 170 to 180 knots. The captain calls for gear down, which will increase the drag of the aircraft and reduce the speed. This is a desired effect when slowing the aircraft for an approach. But once the required speed is achieved, an increase in power output from the engines needs to be commanded by the pilot by increasing the thrust lever position, or the speed will continue to bleed away. As you can see, no such increase in lever position is made. The aircraft's autopilot is engaged and has been commanded to fly the aircraft level at 2,300 feet until the aircraft has intercepted the glide slope in accordance with the air traffic control clearance received. As the speed reduces, the autopilot will continue to increase the pitch attitude of the aircraft, which in turn increases the angle of attack and lift to maintain the commanded altitude. The captain calls for flap 15, a further increase in drag causing the speed to decay at a faster rate, requiring the autopilot to pitch up even more aggressively to follow the instructions given to it, until the store warning device is activated. The stick shaker in this case. At this stage, this is a fully recoverable situation, but the pilot's actions are important. This is an indication of the control column position. The black shadow area indicates a neutral position. If the control column icon is showing below this, the pilot is most likely pulling the stick towards him, attempting to pull the nose of the aircraft up. If you see the black shadow below the icon, this is a forward placement commanding pitch down, with the pilot attempting to lower the nose. Here is the moment of stick shaker activation, warning the pilot that immediate action is required to avoid a full stall. Generally, the action required here is to without delay disengage the autopilot, reduce the angle of attack by applying forward control column movement. This will usually result in a loss of altitude which must be accepted by the pilot. Level the wings, set the thrust as needed. Establishing climb thrust and a climb pitch attitude is usually desired once recovered from the stall. Retract the speed brakes and regain the desired flight path and configuration. We can see that the pilot actually pulls quite aggressively on the control column and increases the thrust lever position to a high power setting. His actions here are serving to increase the angle of attack and force the aircraft further into a stalled condition. The stick pusher then activates. 
This is a device designed to automatically and quite forcefully push the stick forward to assist the pilot in recovering. These systems are particularly common on T-tail aircraft like the Dash 8. It seems that this doesn't have the desired effect on the pilot flying who is still pulling. Unfortunately the first officer puts the flaps up at this point. The flaps not only increase the drag as we said before, but they also allow the aircraft to fly at slower speeds without stalling. Putting them up at this time increases the stall speed of the aircraft, effectively putting the aircraft into a deeper stalled state. It's sadly unrecoverable at this stage. The NTSB report makes some comments regarding the captain's flight training history. He had failed several check flights during his instrument and commercial flight training on general aviation light aircraft, appearing that his aircraft handling skills were not sufficient to pass on at least two of these failures. The NTSB states as a possibility, the captain's established pattern of first attempt failures might have indicated that he was slow to absorb information, develop skills and gain mastery, or that the training that he received was not adequate. Seeing three first time check ride failures in a row, I would interpret as an indication of very low standards of the flight school or instructor signing the student off for the practical test in question. Three times would suggest that there should have been at least one occasion where the instructor recommending the student for the test should have noticed that the student was clearly not ready for the test. If this standard was set that low, it's likely that the quality of training received was of a similar poor quality. So how well is stalling and stall recovery taught in the general aviation environment? If we search YouTube for a stalling flight lesson, one of the top results is this video here. Here is a fairly prominent aviation YouTuber and instructor certified by the FAA giving a lesson on slow flight and stalling. He converts from slow flight configuration to a power off stall, which is similar to the situation experienced by the Dash 8 crew on the Colgan flight. The instructor pulls the control column through a reduction in power until the aircraft stalls. Let's now watch his demonstration of the recovery and listen to the words he uses to emphasize the key points of the recovery procedure. Now I want to take it to a power off stall. I want you to hold the same pitch that you have out front here. I just want you to bring the carburetor heat back on. I want you to hold the same pitch. And I want you to baby the power back. This is bring the power back. You hear that stall horn horn? I don't know how well you can hear that. It comes right on. Hold it, hold it, hold it. And just like that, there's our stall carburetor heat, full power. Flaps go right to 20 in this aircraft. You gotta know what your go-around procedure is. Carburetor, Carburetor heat, heat, full power. Full power is what the instructor chooses to verbalize for the recovery of the stalled condition. These verbalized actions are not sufficient for recovery. If we watch again, we can see that the instructor applies the correct recovery procedure at the stall by moving the control column forward to reduce the angle of attack but omits this from the verbalization which in my opinion as someone with experience of teaching flight instructors how to teach students makes this an inadequate demonstration. Is this the instructor's fault? Partially yes, given that he must have watched this back and deemed it acceptable to upload this as educational content which has subsequently potentially been viewed by 22,000 flight students. But not entirely his fault, he's a product of a system that treats stalling like a check ride maneuver and a hoop to jump through. Here's another example of an instructor teaching a late stage private student in test preparation. We'll do a power off stall. Oh, power off stall. Nope, fail. Can you tell me why? That would have been a fail. Butler, traffic. Uh, uh, was it not at 70? Clear for the active. Well, the I don't power. You didn't, you didn't establish a descent before you tried to stall it. He interjects with fail as the student is setting up for the stall and natters through a debrief of the entry while the student is flying the recovery as if it's not important. It seems here that the entry to the stall is being treated as more of a priority than the recovery, which completely devalues the meaning and purpose of the training. Has a system that produces stall training like this contributed to various accidents in both GA and commercial aviation? I would suggest that this is the case. Here's an example of the way stalling is practiced in initial training. The student is maybe briefed on the completion standards as per the flight school syllabus or the relevant standards document prior to the flight. Or maybe not because the instructor is most likely not paid for their time during pre-flight briefing so skips it entirely. Now we're in the air. 
The instructor, who received minimal training on how to actually convey information, who is probably not long qualified as a pilot themselves, and is just trying to build hours for their airline job that they can't wait to get to, doesn't provide a demonstration and talks the students through the power off store. Do some clearing turns. Reduce the power to 1700. Slow to 65 knots. Full flap. Descend 100 feet or so. Now pull back. That's the store. Pitch down. Add some power. Climb. Reduce the flaps. OK, let's go and do some landings. Has the student learned anything about the threat and error management associated with store recognition or store recovery during this training? Not one bit, and this student will not have sufficient respect for them when they become an instructor and the cycle goes on. What's the solution? Firstly, we need to manage more comprehensive flight instructor training and fix a system that encourages poorly motivated and underpaid instructors to provide lackluster training, but that's another video. We need to provide more context to store training. A cheap and safe solution would be to use flight simulator software or training devices. Imagine during training you were sat in a cockpit environment being shown realistic store scenarios and practice recoveries with the ground quickly coming up to meet you. We could use this to simulate all kinds of scenarios, getting low on approach and pitching up without adding sufficient power. Over pitching on a go around. Over banking after overshooting the final on base leg. These are situations that are difficult to put into a realistic scenario when practicing at a safe altitude in a real aircraft and therefore reduces the effectiveness of the intended learning objectives. I would prefer to see a mandatory module in private and commercial training that includes this kind of training which I believe can only serve to increase awareness of the threats and errors that we all need to be aware of when flying low and slow, during takeoff and landing phases of flight for example. Instructors should be required to take regular recurrent training on how to teach these stalling exercises, including a fully comprehensive briefing of how these kinds of scenarios develop, and how we recognize and recover from them before it's too late. As it stands, the training simply isn't good enough. And remember, when you crash a simulator, the only thing you can bruise is your ego.